and we are on the bell tower we're in the bell tower of the town hall if you think of it functionally and logistically over the years it's 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 found its place on the map because of its strategic location and where it sits at the foothills of the Apennine Rains and fairly near uh, to some major river sources uh, which once upon a time were much more navigable than they are today in fact the Tiber River the main river that leads through Rome, that cuts through the center of Rome, uh, and the Arno River that leads towards the Mediterranean through Florence, uh, is both have their source here in Arezzo, just in the hills. So again, it, it's strategically located on the peninsula, and that's been an important part of its history. And of course, if we think about uh, some of the readings we've done on the geography of the peninsula, uh, maybe we could think of Arezzo as a microcosm of this much larger idea of these kind of uh, microclimates and these microcultures that grow up in Italy on a peninsula due to the geography. So you can see behind me quite a few hills. Arezzo sits at the confluence of several smaller valleys that lead into the mountains beyond. And because of this accessibility to the passes throughout the history of the town of Arezzo, way back in the Etruscan period, 1200 years before the birth of Christ, BCE, uh, all the way up through the Roman period, in which Arezzo was a very important Roman town, uh, really beginning in the first century BCE, up until fairly modern times. Uh, one of the reasons that Arezzo was bombed in World War II was because it sat at a very important geographic strategic location on the peninsula. So my point is that uh, because of the importance of Arezzo, at the beginning of the, the series of passes that you need to go through in order to get to the other side of the peninsula that is moving from west to east, which is always difficult here because of the Apennine Range, uh, Arezzo has always been a town that has had some kind of occupation associated with it, mainly beginning in these early primitive cultures the on the hills. And so when you travel in these towns, you'll see that the early Etruscan sites be they the temple sites or the business sites, uh, whatever they may be, will be up on top of the hill. And then, of course, it makes it easier to fortify. As the Romans make their way into these towns, they tend to occupy the lowland around the hills uh, to drill troops, to build the cities that eventually will be kind of their, their, um, their hallmark uh, in terms of expansion. I think one of the really interesting aspects of exploring these, these towns, uh, and Arezzo is, is particularly useful in trying to illustrate this idea, is that there is a, almost a, a, an onion-like effect. There's multiple layers to the city. What we're walking through today, and, and, and its various facets, is obviously medieval. The city, in the way that you see it when you walk around in the historic center of Arezzo, dates to the 1200s, 1300s. Um, and so it's, it's important that you see that and you recognize that and that's first and foremost what you, what you visualize when you come into the city. But the really interesting contextual uh, understanding of these medieval city-states, Arezzo in particular, is that there are many layers underneath. And I've kind of alluded to this in that there was an Etruscan culture that was here. Uh, Arezzo was one of the most important of these Etruscan cities. There were 12 of the major cities in what was known as Etruria, or what will later be known as Tuscany. Um, 
they were, Arezzo was one of, uh, of the most important of these 12 confederation cities. And so, again, that's visible in various parts as one of the layers. Then you have the Romans, in which Arezzo becomes Aretium. It becomes this very important Roman town that uh, some, histori some historians have, have suggested that it was the third largest town outside of Rome in Capua. Might be a bit of an exaggeration there, but the idea is that uh, Rome thought Aretium or Arezzo was, was an important town because of its strategic location. There's that layer to it as well. And of course, as the Romans pass into the, the darkness of history, the mists of time, uh, that Christian uh, moment rises to the top and it becomes a very, very important uh, Christian town. Uh, it becomes the largest diocese and I, st I think still is today in, in, in Italy. And so the bishops become extremely powerful. They almost become uh, leaders, uh, political, well they are, political leaders as well as spiritual leaders in the city. So again, layer upon layer upon layer. Some of the angles that we can glimpse the city from allude to this. Uh, the hills are interconnected with this layered history. Uh, the, his the hill where the fortress is was separated from the hill where the cathedral is. Now you can almost throw a baseball across the park and, and hit one to the other if you've got a strong arm. But traditionally, these two hills were separated uh, by a ravine. This is very typical of the Etruscan building process, urban planning. Uh, in the 1560s, uh, when the Medici effectively take over run roughshod over Arezzo, and thus begins that, that animosity between the Aretines and the, and the Florentines. The entire area of the park, with its beautiful views, has to be remembered in this layering approach as the third, it is a third of the city. So right now we see two thirds of the middle, medieval city walking around in modern times. A third of the city was devastated by the Medici Dukes in the 1560s. It was torn to the ground, torn down. And the stone and the brick that was left was used to build a fortress on the hill that you see today to protect the Florentines from the Aretini, from the Arezzo folks. And so that look that you see now, the beautiful park with the fortress that's being redone, it's fantastic, it's great for tourism, but it represents kind of a thumb in the eye to the Aretini, the citizens of Arezzo, because it's a symbol of Medici dominance as part of this layering effect. And next to it, Across the, net, the park that you see today is the cathedral complex. So you have these two entities that wield power here in the city from the very beginning of its inception in the Etruscans period all the way up until modern times. That is the political center and the religious center. So all of that is embedded into these layers in a way that requires the visitor to take a little bit of time, take a little patience, and maybe do a little bit more research. And in order to come to a better understanding of how this city came to be, and its importance in the history of the peninsula, you need to dig into those layers and try to mine the important aspects uh, of that history. We're in the Piazza Grande here in Arezzo, and uh, this is a really good opportunity to show you a little bit more about the layering effect that we can see when we're walking around these medieval towns. The piazza itself is kind of at a strange angle, as you can see behind me. Um, that is not usual. Uh, most of these Italian city-states had big, wide-open piazzas that were flat, so you could certainly uh, bring the cattle in, you could bring produce in. It was the economic epicenter of these, these smaller towns. This one sits on kind of on an angle, which has a lot to do with the fact that Arezzo itself sits on an angle. The city is built in kind of a radial approach. It's not a real grid system in the way that you would normally associate an Etruscan town and then a Roman town, but rather kind of a radial effect based on the hill uh, where the town hall is and the cathedral. But at this point, you can see the effects of the hill. But this Piazza Grande is fairly large, I guess, for a smaller town, but it used to be a much, much bigger piazza. It was probably twice the size that you see today. And that diminution process took place in the 1560s, again, under the Medici Dukes. So once the Medici Dukes had effectively controlled the Aretini after many, many years of revolts and, and uprisings, they finally began to uh, reshape the city in their image, that is the Medici Dukes. And so the piazza became smaller, 
And Georgia Vasari builds this fantastic loggia uh, that allows for shops and um, official uh, entities, and taxes, lawyers that are associated with the Medici Dukes to uh, set up shop here in this loggia. There's this long, beautiful arcade that makes uh, the piazza very comfortable on a hot summer day. Uh, some of the other things that you can envision here are the various architectural entities here. We have a, uh, a building called the Laiichi, which is representative of a home of a lay fraternity that was very important to the history of the city and still is today. It began in the 13th century and exists all the way up until uh, modern times and still very much a part of the local fabric today. You can see the back side of the apse of the most important church probably, even I would suggest more important than the cathedral itself, uh, the Pieve or the baptismal church that was here in the center of town. That was here long before the cathedral uh, that we see today was ever around. Okay, we're standing on one of the main streets in Arezzo in the medieval part, the historic center of the city called Corso Italia. Uh, it was renamed probably a million different times over the, over the centuries, but halfway between the lower part of the city and the upper part of the city sits a very important church called the Pieve. Now we're not really sure exactly where the word Pieve comes from. It probably has a lot to do with this idea of popular. Uh, regardless, traditionally a Pieve church is a church in which baptisms were formed. So you can imagine being an ancient church here in the city center had a very important place in the spiritual fabric of the city. We're talking about a church that dates back to at least the 11th century. Uh, some people even suggest that this is in and around the area where the first cathedral complex was here in Arezzo. Now, that may not sound like much, but Arezzo has the honor of being the first Christian city outside of Rome. So we're talking about the fourth century here. Um, and so as part of this, this apostolic history of the city, uh, there is this constant search for the first cathedral. That is the first seat of the Bishop of Arezzo. And there's not really any really kind of consensus on, on what where that church was. Some people think it might have been here in the ancient city center. So regardless, we have a very old church that's been a, very much a part of the spiritual fabric of the city for centuries. And now I juxtapose that with the cathedral. The cathedral as we see it today dates to the 13th century. What you basically have is this intimate side of the spirituality of Arezzo and this more public side of the spirituality of Arezzo as represented by the Catholic Church in Rome. Uh, this church, the Pieve, is really truly the heart and soul of the city, spiritually speaking. Um, you can see, based on the date, the style is, is Romanesque. Uh, fantastic multitude of, of columns that you see on the facade it gives it that Romanesque style component. Uh, there are very small windows, uh, it's a very, kind of a darker space on the inside, but uh, regardless, it wasn't always about the aesthetics, it was about the spiritual presence of, of the place, and of course that's where why it takes on this importance in the city. Now, the other thing to consider is this whole process by which the church, the Pieve, is situated on this important thoroughfare of medieval Arezzo. The other streets that come together here are a part of a language of architecture that you need to be aware of when you're walking around town. It's not just a building, let's talk about it as an object, we can infer spirituality because it is a church, but it's, it's much more complex and convoluted than that. The church takes on a very particular kind of a, an architectural language that's best kind of envisioned or illustrated by the terrace out front. Uh, when we go to the top of the terrace, we immediately, because we rise above the street level in a very kind of monumental way, we have uh, the ability to view out down the course of Italia, the main thoroughfare. We can look up towards the cathedral complex. We can look to each side and see the various smaller streets where the shops would have been filled. So we sit at the confluence of these entities within the medieval city that make it tick, that make it run, that are part of the everyday lifeblood of the city and addressing the crowds from that point with that spiritual backdrop gives the message uh, a really profound resonance and importance and of course the bishops would key in on that and they would very much use that urban landscape to their advantage and to emphasize their messages be they secular or be they religious so it's a it's a church that not only is the heart and soul of the city but it's also it's evocative of the power and the prestige of the church or the messages that are being spoken by the individuals coming out of the church or speaking from that, that monumental terrace out front.
Some of the other aspects of this piazza have to do with, again, the layering effect, but much more modern, that have to do with the 1930s. Uh, during the fascist period, Mussolini kind of enabled these small city-states to take on a presence of their own. So they were asked to kind of recreate their past, to, to glorify that past, that individualized quality that each one of these city-states had uh, back in the day before unification in the 1860s and 70s. So the monies that came in from Rome during the fascist period were used to reconstruct these towns to make them look more authentic, if you will. Of course, we don't do that these days with buildings and historic monuments, but in the 1920s and 30s, there was this process by which everything looked medieval. Uh, there was a famous joust uh, that was performed here, and eventually uh, that joust becomes very much, and still is very much today, a part of the fabric of the city. Uh, but the joust was a reinvention of this medieval tradition, and again, under, under fascism. Much of the buildings, or many of the buildings here, have this very medieval kind of feel. They have balconies on the outside, they have crenellation, tower homes are reconstructed. All of that is done under uh, the fascist reign to bring these cities back to life and to give them their own sense of self within this unified whole that Italy had become and was very necessary for this eventual war movement. One of the important layers of the history of Arezzo is this period really between 1943 and, and 1945. So obviously I'm talking about World War II here. Um, Arezzo itself doesn't necessarily play a, a, a pivotal role. It's not a Monte Cassino battle site or anything like that. Um, but because it is at a strategic location, and of course that would mean in World War II that the train lines were very important here. They were, this was one of the areas where the train lines would begin, begin to go east-west, um, not just north-south, but we're at, the, we're at that kind of nexus point for the train lines to be able to do that. And so it was strategic in that sense. So as Mark's, Mark Clark's Fifth Army was making its way up from the south, um, there were a series of bombings that were, um, were done by the Allies. This was called Operation Strangle, and the idea was to just bomb the forward or the northern advance of the Axis armies, the German army. Uh, and so as a result, uh, many of these towns that were strategically located, like Arezzo, Monte Cassino is another example, though Arezzo, again, Arezzo doesn't take on that kind of importance as a pivotal battle, but it was a part of the bombing strategy under Operation Strangle, and it was devastated. So 50% of the city was destroyed. Most people don't realize that when they walk through the city, but you'll see as you look around you, some of the buildings are very old, some of the buildings look strangely new, uh, or maybe post-World War II kind of style, very blocky, very f modular, very functional, to be quite honest. When the war ends, there was a desperate need to rebuild and to and to create homes for people to move back into the city, to populate the city again. And so during these bombing raids, 50% uh, of the city of Arezzo was, was destroyed, and you'll see that as, as evidence of, of the past, recent past. Um, the building behind me here is a part of a very particular kind of museum. It's a collector's museum. It's called the Bruschi Museum. Um, Bruschi was the man who founded the, the Antiques Fair that is world famous here in Arezzo. So, the building itself was bombed out in World War II. And there was a, a fountain that remained after the bombing, but the entire section of this city block, medieval city block, was destroyed. So up until about five years ago or so, there was nothing happening here except for the remnants of this fountain. Uh, recently, they rebuilt the structure uh, based on the same footprint and the same square footage, more or less. And a lot of that has to do with this Rubik's Cube quality of building things that are new within a medieval center. Uh, this is the Historic Monuments Board uh, and their way of reconciling the, the need for present structures and the past, and preserving the past, the traditions, and the look of, of the past. So what you see is a, a building that's obviously modern incorporated into a, an older fountain. So this is just a kind of a fun example of, of how the Historic Monuments Board in Arezzo, and you can think about this in a macrocosm in Italy at large, how they reconcile the past and the present. <laughs>